Um, so today's speaker is Professor Seth Lloyd. Seth received his PhD in 1988 at Rockefeller University, where he studied under the supervision of Heinz Pagels. His thesis was titled Black Holes, Demons, and the Loss of Coherence, How Complex Systems Get Information and What They Do With It. He then proceeded to do a postdoc at Caltech in high energy physics. And between 1991 and 1994, Seth was a postdoc at Los Alamos, where he, with colleagues, founded the field of modern quantum computing. In 1994, Seth joined MIT, where he still works as a professor at the Department of Engineering. On top of that, Seth has had a stint here in Cambridge, where he did a degree in the philosophy of science a few years ago. Um, so Professor Seth Lloyd is known for having founded or been a part of founding the fields of quantum metrology, quantum illumination, quantum machine learning, and continuous variable quantum information. And on top of that, he's a world leading expert on quantum time travel, which is I, why I never worry that he's ever gonna be late for a talk, which indeed he hasn't been. So with those words, thanks a lot, Seth, for joining us. It's, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, David. It's a great pleasure to be back. I wish I were actually back in Cambridge, which is one of my very favorite cities. So I was a graduate student there doing part three maths and then an MPhil in history and philosophy of science, and it was a great time. And indeed, it was doing this MPhil in history and philosophy of science <clears throat> under the supervision of Jeremy Butterfield that I first started working on ideas of quantum mechanics and information. Um, this was in 1984. And it wasn't very popular at that time, let's put it that way. But it, it has become more popular since. <clears throat> um, so uh, uh, as uh, uh, David was saying, please, uh, I'm going to actually, at various points, I'm going to stop and uh, ask for questions and just keep the questions coming in in the q and I'll try to stop every five, five minutes or so, and I'll read out the questions in the Q&A and attempt to answer them. I think that's more fun. And then we'll, we'll leave a bunch of time uh, at the end. <clears throat> okay, so, so I'm gonna uh, share my screen now. <clears throat> okay, can people see, every, see this here? <clears throat> so uh, I, I thought that when uh, David asked me to talk here, I thought it'd be fun to talk a little bit about um, the whole state of the field of quantum computing because things have gone, you know, things are in great shape right now. There's a, a huge amount of work has been done. There are tremendously coherent devices, superconducting systems, ion traps, spin systems, all optical systems, et cetera. And uh, now actually there's also a vibrant uh, and growing commercial sector for quantum computing. It's not quite clear what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, <laughs> and I'll talk about it a little bit. So it, on this diagram right here, um, I've drawn a picture of uh, th this axis is to the time axis. Um, and uh, here we are at the NISC era for near term intermediate uh, scale quantum systems. Um, and then um, it's projected, people are hoping that we could get to full blown fault tolerance in the next 10 or 20 years. I put this at 2035 plus or minus never, because we actually, it's a hard problem getting to fault tolerance. So we don't know actually if it's going to happen or not. And um, then this black curve right here, I'm not exactly sure what uh, this axis is. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, hype, enthusiasm, interest, et cetera. I just note that in, in, between, it, in between now and the point where most of the you know, large scale applications of quantum computing are supposed to kick in, there's a, uh, a gap or a chasm the quantum chasm, the chasm with a Q. And it would be great to, to figure out how to bridge this gap. And I'm gonna make a proposal here for how I think it is, what I think is a good way to bridge this gap by using the devices that people are building now um, actually to solve problems uh, where we can actually have useful applications for near term and current quantum computers. And um, the way I propose to do this, I'm gonna suggest that we should do this is we should back off and look at how quantum computers work, um, uh, which is in general by taking highly coherent quantum systems and then controlling them via applying time-dependent semi-classical fields to manipulate their Hamiltonians to change their Hamiltonian dynamics. Um, 
And so that's, uh, you know, of course, one can use this to make quantum logic gates. But I would like to suggest that if we actually use the full suite of time dependent Hamiltonian controls, then we can actually take many common algorithms that are used, and we might be able to implement it in a way that's useful now. So I'm going to describe to you this field of Hamiltonian quantum computing. Um, and uh, you may note that my, uh, my affiliation here is MIT and Turing. Turing is a uh, quantum computing company. Uh, that I know there are many quantum computing companies. It seems like uh, burning coals to Newcastle. And these, these protocols that I'm describing are protocols that our company, Turing, is implementing in collaboration with uh, various quantum computing companies, hardware companies like INQ and Google and uh, Xanadu. And then also uh, we're working with people in industry to see if we can't apply these protocols to you know, work, say, help car companies solve you know, linear algebraic problems that are pressure points in self-driving cars, for example. Um, and so uh, uh, this is actually uh, ongoing work. I should say that, that uh, I'm shameless going, going to, if anybody's interested in working with us, we are actually hiring. And, uh, and you're going to find out what we're doing because I'm about to tell you. <clears throat> OK, uh, <clears throat> so uh, are there any questions about this? <laughs> I like questions right away. Pop them up in the Q&A and I'll see them come up. OK, not right now. So let me go on to the second of my, my PowerPoint slides here. So let me just review. I mean, that as, as I'm sure pretty much everybody in the audience knows, quantum computing supplies exponential speedups for various problems in linear algebra, including factoring, uh, quantum linear systems algorithm, solving differential equations on high dimensional spaces, quantum simulation of physical systems, and for problems of data analysis and machine learning. And then it supplies quadratic speedups for problems like search or combinatorial optimization. Um, <clears throat> so for example, trying to find approximate solutions to NP-complete problems, traveling salesman problem, et cetera. So this is great. I mean, this is great. And, and it's a rather remarkable thing that it's the case. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, and the question is, can we do this sooner rather than later? Because if you look at the problem at fault-tolerant quantum computing, fault-tolerant quantum computing requires a very large uh, overhead uh, in your machine where you know hundreds of, of physical qubits per logical qubit. And that's a very daunting technological challenge. Meanwhile, we have current devices that have between 50 and 100 qubits and actually have very fine coherence properties. I mean, ion traps in particular are not limited by quantum coherence because the coherence times of the hyperfine levels in ions are you know, hundreds or thousands of seconds. So they're limited by other technical factors. So the question is, can we actually get these benefits, uh, promised benefits from quantum computing sooner rather than later? <clears throat> so and here's the problem, I'm just stating it here. If we have gate-based quantum computing in which we build up our quantum computation out of a sequence of quantum logic gates, and there's an error rate epsilon per logic gate, then essentially you're limited to order one over epsilon gates before you have an error, and then you have to uh, uh, pop in some form of fault tolerance or quantum error correction. Now there's this, uh, that's the problem I just described. And then there's a second problem. If you go back to this slide right here, people tell me I'm, I'm relying on you, David, it's just say if you can't see my slides. So just like a, pop me a message if that's true. If you look at these applications for data analysis and machine learning, which actually if given the ability of quantum computing to give exponential speed ups for linear algebra, there's a very large number of possible applications for data driven problems in quantum computing. But then you have a rather a more or less serious problems that to load data, uh, classical data into a quantum state, the conventional method for doing this is using a quantum random access memory and quantum random access memories, well, beautiful systems and prototypes have been built are still also a long way away, perhaps not as far as fault tolerance. So, but these two problems, fault tolerance and quantum random access memory are hard quantum engineering problems. And indeed it's likely to take quite a while to solve them. Okay, <clears throat> so how do we go, how are we going to address this solution? 
So this is the solution that we're advocating at Turing, but you know, anybody can advocate this solution. It's just what I described. Let's, we're going to recast uh, many, if not all of well-known quantum algorithms in particular the ones for linear algebra, uh, almost all of the algorithms for uh, uh, quantum algorithms for linear algebra can be recast in terms of time dependent Hamiltonian control. And similarly, I'm going to uh, just do a very simple back of the envelope kind of calculation that says, uh, that, that, that looks at how much classical information we can actually load into quantum computers over the coherence time. So the generic picture of quantum computing and with Hamiltonian control is that you have a time dependent Hamiltonian and you have the, the bare or native Hamiltonian of your system. And then you apply a set of time dependent controls, which could be microwave pulses applied to Josephson junctions, uh, modulating the flux in, in a loop, or they could be lasers where you're zapping individual atoms or ions with lasers. And these gammas, these time dependent control fields are, are the inputs to your quantum computer. So for example, uh, uh, it, this is a cartoonish picture of um, the native Hamiltonian, both for ion traps and for cavity quantum electrodynamics, either atoms in an optical cavity or uh, uh, superconducting systems interacting with a microwave control line. The native Hamiltonian, you have individual qubit terms, which could be say some combination of sigma X and sigma Z. And then you have a set of modes. These are the cavity modes here with their different frequencies. And then you've got couplings between the individual qubits in the modes where they can exchange excitation with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, the modes of the electromagnetic field, um, exchange photons. And then the applied fields in the case where you're zapping individual ions, let's say, or individual atoms or individual superconducting systems with, um, with lasers or microwaves, these are just time dependent individual Pauli terms where, in, where you tend to have quite large, uh, large degree of control over the individual rotations that you apply to these qubits. <clears throat> And so then the question is, let's, you know, of course, it's quite possible and they're, they're well-known schemes that indeed back in 1993, I, I created the first scheme for taking systems like this and showing how you can use electromagnetic resonance to construct sequences of quantum logic gates. But let's ask what we can do if we go beyond just quantum logic gates. <clears throat> so we, <clears throat> we have here, we have, let me just like go, go into what the kinds of Hamiltonians we can apply are. So in general, we can apply, there's a very simple uh, geometric criterion for the set of possible effective Hamiltonians you can apply if you go and you tickle all these ions or atoms or superconducting qubits with your applied controls, what kinds of effective dynamics can you construct? <clears throat> so essentially, you know, here's just the picture in, in a trotterized time sliced form of, of what you apply. First, you apply one Hamiltonian for a particular time. And then at a very small time later, your fields have varied by a small amount. So a time less than the bandwidth of the controls. Now you're applying another Hamiltonian for a small period of time. Then you apply another Hamiltonian for a small period of time, another Hamiltonian for a small period of time. And this is just the trotterized or time sliced picture of the unitary that you're constructing. And this means that you can construct this effective Hamiltonian. I'll just write it like that. And you see that if I were to expand these exponentials in terms of Taylor series, and then uh, uh, see under conditions where I can ignore the higher order terms because they're small, which is reasonable because these delta t's are small, then you see that the effective Hamiltonians are polynomials in the, uh, the bare, the native Hamiltonian and the applied fields. Um, and in particular, uh, the, 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 the geometric statement is that you can construct or implement any effective Hamiltonian that is in the algebra that's generated by the drift Hamiltonian and by the applied Hamiltonians. Now, it may not be easy to generate any such Hamiltonian, but there are ones that you can generate, lot, you can generate anything in the algebra. And rather generically, the algebra closes into the set of Hamiltonians for the entire set of unitary transformations on your set of qubits. But of course, we're gonna be interested in the things that one can apply over a uh, relatively short period of time where we can preserve coherence. 
And, but there, at, at any rate, there are a wide variety of effective Hamiltonians. Moreover, these effective Hamiltonians are going to be different for different quantum computing platforms. So if I go back to the previous slide, um, and let's look at these interaction terms here in the native Hamiltonian, in ion traps or in cavity QED, then every single uh, uh, atom superconducting qubit is coupled to the cavity. And that means that, that these lambdas mean that, that every qubit is coupled to every mode of the cavity. Whereas if I have a set of superconducting qubits that are, are in some two-dimensional array and they have nearest neighbor couplings, then these, these couplings are more limited and they only reflect couplings between nearest neighbors in this array. And consequently, if I look at the effective dynamics that I can construct or implement, then these are gonna be different for different quantum computing platforms. And so the scaling and the set of problems which you're going to be able to solve are going to be different. Okay, <clears throat> um, so, so before I go on, um, oh, well, let, let me just go, uh, are there any questions at this point? Is it clear what we're looking at? We're, we're looking at, we're going to say, hey, look, we don't have to, for, for quantum logic gates, we actually have to effectively turn off all these interactions between, you know, if I want to do a quantum logic gate between qubit five and qubit seven, I have to effectively turn on the interaction between qubit five and qubit seven, and then I have to decouple them from everything else. And this decoupling is actually very hard, and it's one of the primary technological problems in actually building large scale quantum computing. It, it's, it's actually making things not interact is tough to do because they naturally want to interact. And so what we're gonna look at is we're gonna say, let's see what happens if everything's interacting and we're going to use the, uh, uh, the take advantage of these always on interactions to see what kinds of effective quantum information processing we can do. I see something's in the chat. Uh, uh, Hugo has asked, would you like, to, would you choose the Hamiltonian to suit a quantum computing platform or the other way around? That is, Hamilton is to solve a problem in quantum computing platform most appropriate given the Hamiltonian. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, so for example, um, when we talk with the folks at INQ, for example, then we look at uh, their ion trap Hamiltonians, which are, I've actually, you know, this is a kind of a schematic. I've ignored all the other energy levels of the, of the ions and the ion traps. So there's a, a cartoonish picture. And then we try to devise methods for things like for loading the data onto the ion trap quantum computer and for trying to solve the problem that are specific for that quantum computing architecture. Whereas if we're looking at you know, something like what Google is doing, where they actually have, have um, nearest neighbor or next to nearest neighbor interactions, then we have to tailor what we're trying to do to that specific architecture. So there's a sense in which we're, we're, we're in order to take advantage of the actual tremendous coherence and power of these beautiful devices, which are beautiful, but not yet ready for fault tolerance. Uh, we actually have to go the opposite direction from which many people are thinking, like, you know, making device independent pictures of what's going on, which is, you know, totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But to make something happen, we believe that it's going to be necessary to go to the nitty gritty of how each individual device works and then tailor the problems to the actual Hamiltonians of these devices. <clears throat> okay, good question. <clears throat> All right, so, um, <clears throat> Uh, so let me actually just run some numbers here. And uh, again, please, uh, I, want, I want people to, uh, to ask their questions as, as we go along. I've somehow I've lost my little Zoom, uh, my Q&A thing. So uh, <laughs> let's hope that it shows up here again. Um, <clears throat> uh, so let's, I'm gonna compare this with small depth quantum circuits. Now it's the ordinary, uh, metric for how well you can do things is the number of quantum logic gates you can put in things. And so uh, what I'm going to, here we're not doing quantum logic gates, but we can do a kind of a picture of this trotterized Hamiltonian gate count, which really is basically the whole number, the number of distinct trotter steps that one can pop into uh, this uh, quantum information processor before things go haywire. So I'll just give some numbers. I took these numbers for ion traps because um, uh, well, for one thing, ion traps are very coherent. And really the, the gate count is just, it's just the, uh, the bandwidth of your control fields 
times the amount of time over you're applying it. That's the number of these steps that you can apply. And then times the number of controls that you can actually apply. So that if you, in this case, since each individual ion has an individual control, so let's suppose we just take realistic numbers. So we have 100 megahertz, 50 seconds, which I just, you know, it's less than the actual coherence times of these ions, but that's what people like Chris Monroe tell me is a reasonable thing to think of. And then the number of ions is 100. That's a bit aspirational at the moment, but that's, I just picked it because it's a round number. And then you have two times 10 to the eighth, which is 100 megahertz times 50 times 100, you get 10 to the 12th. That is, you can have essentially 10 to the 12th, a circuit with effective, uh, uh, you know, Hamiltonian depth, uh, Hamiltonian gate count be something more like 10 to the 12th. And what, let's compare that with, with quantum, ordinary quantum logic operations where you get a gate count of something like, uh, uh, where you get a gate count of, um, of something like 10 to the fourth for a gate error rate of 10 to the minus four, which is, you know, that's right at the edge of what people can actually do right now. Um, <clears throat> anyway, of course, there's all sorts of problems of noise and decoherence, the pulse accuracy, the interactions and crosstalk, and these are gonna limit what you can actually do. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, let me actually go on uh, to, let me do the same, the same back of the envelope calculation. This is a very back of the envelope calculation, but it's, um, I'd say it's the right calculation to do. Let's go and look at the same calculation if we look at the amount of classical data that we can pop in. So the data entry, it's the same calculation. We're gonna encode classical data into our time-dependent Hamiltonian. And let's just ask how many bits, how many classical bits are being injected into our quantum system over the coherence time. And it's really the same number. It's just, it's just the bandwidth times the time times the number of control. And then in addition, you have the number of bits per sample of your sample laser fields that are going in there. And when I look at this, then I just do the same number and I just, let's say we have 10 bits per sample and we get 10 to the 13 bits that we can pop in in these 50 seconds. And, and this, of course, again, as you compare this with, with putting uh, classical information into a, uh, a ordinary quantum logic circuit, which has 10 to the fourth gates, which is a bit aspirational for current quantum logic circuits, but it, people are getting up there. And then you find that as you have maybe 10 to the five bits for gate-based quantum computing. So I just say the numbers here look good is how, is how, I, would, uh, is how I, would, I would describe it. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let, let me see if I, I'm not, I'm not seeing, are there any questions there in the chat? I'm actually, here we go. We have a, a is there a question in the Q&A? Yes, great. Anonymous attendee, Professor Lloyd, what do you make of the current state of claimed fault tolerant qubits, such as very recently published in Nature? Okay, um, uh, I'm not sure what paper you're referring to, uh, uh, but it is. I mean, the there is a fault tolerance, and I'm actually. You see, I'm not actually going to talk about fault tolerance here. But since you ask, I'll say, well, okay. You know, it's with current kinds of codes. You know, you 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 might be able to get by. Uh, like, like surface codes or torque codes or things like that, you might be able to scrape by with 100 physical qubits per logical qubit. Um, <clears throat> but the, the, this, of course, is in terms of fields to look into, this is a very important field. If we could make get fault tolerance with far fewer physical qubits, that would be great. But that's, it's been slow progress for that. Okay, so great question. So and here, are, there are lots of applications. I mean, there are linear, so you, can, you, uh, you can actually all show that you can apply this to linear systems, constrain quadratic optimization to linear differential equations. Um, but I'm gonna describe in some detail now how you actually do the quantum singular value transform, which Ike, my colleague Ike Chuang has called the mother algorithm for all quantum for quantum computing. I mean, this might be a bit of an exaggeration, but actually not really, because in fact, the most efficient way to solve linear systems to do constrained quadratic optimization and to solve linear differential equations is in fact to do this quantum singular value transform. So, so what is the quantum singular value transform? So, so actually this was introduced um, in uh, uh, a paper that I wrote with Abhinathan 
Hasidim in Aram Harrow in 2008, it's sometimes called HHL, which is the first paper for doing quantum linear systems, we noted that you could, add, in fact, do the quantum singular value transform. And it works as follows. So I'm just going to write a matrix A. It doesn't have to be square. Um, and it, it can, I'm writing it in quantum form. It's got a bunch of singular values. And then it's about, got a bunch of left singular vectors, which are bras here, and right singular vectors, which are cats. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to define f of A to be the matrix that has the same set of singular vectors, right and left singular ve vectors, but the singular values of f are, they are some function of the singular values of f. And uh, the, uh, in HHL, we showed how to do this by using the quantum phase estimation algorithm. And the function that we, we focused on there was f of x is equal to one over x. And then if A is a square matrix and f of x is one over x, then f of A is just A inverse. It's just the inverse matrix. And so the quantum singular value transform shows how you, uh, uh, how you can um, apply, if you can apply A, you can apply f of A. And particularly, for example, if you can apply A, you can apply A inverse. So you can see how this actually uh, fits is a rather powerful quantum algorithm. That, but this was proposed in 2008, and most recently in the last couple year or two, there have been very significant advances that go way beyond quantum phase estimation in terms of improving the scaling of this algorithm. Um, uh, a paper with Andras Gillian is the first author, and I forget the other authors. I was actually supposed to be on this paper, but I, I didn't understand it because it had something like 70 theorems and 140 lemmas and stuff like that. And so I, I declined to be part of this paper. Uh, and uh, so, but it's, um, it, the, the scaling is now really at the optimal. So the kind of, the, 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 the new scaling is at the optimal level. And I'm gonna show you now how to do this using, um, how to do this using uh, the, uh, in the Hamiltonian format. And I actually claim that this is a heck of a lot easier than, than uh, it's a heck of a lot easier than, um, uh, than actually doing it in the gate model. Um, indeed, I hope to be able to, show, to explain to you, I don't have that much time, but I hope to be able to uh, explain to you um, uh, pretty much what's going on with this and the next few slides, which given that the original paper, as I said, is like something like, you know, 55 pages, 70 theorems and 140 lemmas. Uh, if I can make this happen, that'll be great. Okay, so let's look at this in, in some detail now. And um, uh, let's, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna check to see if there are any questions. I don't see any questions in the chat right now. So I'll just go on. All right, so what is our assumptions for the Hamiltonian singular value, quantum singular value transform? We're assuming we're gonna apply some Hamiltonian H, plus or minus H, we're gonna apply H, we're gonna be able to undo it. And this matrix A, this one right here, that we're going to try to perform this transformation on are, represents an off diagonal block of H. So we have A on this side and A dagger, and we actually don't care what's on these other blocks for a simple reason that we're also gonna assume we can apply this matrix, this Hamilton and call Z, which swaps the phase of the, the, the low part down here compared with the part up there. And actually what this means, first of all, right off the bat is by very simple refocusing techniques, I can simply get rid of these on diagonal parts. And so without loss of generality, I can assume that H is of this form, zero on the diagonals, A and A dagger on the off diagonals. And then the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this H, if you just like look them out, they are, they are related to the singular vectors and singular values. We have H times the right singular vector up here, and then down below is plus or minus the left singular value, is plus or minus the singular value, that's now the eigenvalue of, of uh, H, times the same vector. So the eigenvectors of H are, are combinations of right singular values up top and left singular values down below, with plus or minus, and the, eigenve the eigenvalues of H are these plus or minus these singular vectors. 
And you know, here's just, you see, this is just a definition, A times the right singular vector is sigma J times the left singular vector, A dagger times the left singular vector is sigma J times the right singular vector. And if you squint at H here, I think you'll, you'll see that that's basically, uh, you, you'll, see, you'll see how the, this works. It's just a, a one line, you know, not even a one line calculation. <clears throat> okay, so that's just a review. And now, but now what, something quite interesting happens. Just a second. Yeah. Someone has sent me a question in a private message. Uh, so I'll just, read, I'll just read that for you. Yeah, read it, thanks. Uh, and, and they're asking what kind of Hamiltonians have this form that you were given on the previous slide? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, all Hamiltonians, <laughs> all Hamiltonians have this form. <laughs> right? They've got on diagonal blocks and off diagonal blocks. And then if you can apply, uh, if you can apply this Z, which simply changes the phase of the, of the actually uh, left singular values compared with the right singular values, then you can turn it into Hamiltonian this form. And the set of effective Hamiltonians that you can apply, remember, there's a very large set of effective Hamiltonians that you can apply. Um, uh, again, the anything generated in this algebra generated by your drift, your, your native Hamiltonian in the control fields, any one of those is possible. Great, and, and, and David, if, if, uh, since I'm actually having, for some reason, Zoom is not showing me the chat, if you could just interject and interrupt where, if, if questions show up there, uh, we can answer them right away. Okay, I will do, thanks. Good, good, right. So, but it's, of course, it's a very good question because, you know, the $64,000 question, well, $64,000 doesn't buy you what it used to, but <laughs> the million dollar question is, can you actually uh, load data in the form of these time dependent Hamiltonians and have Hamiltonians that do the kind of thing that you want to do? And uh, I, I, I'm gonna argue that in many cases, the answer is yes, but I'm not gonna go that yet because I think I can actually probably explain this quantum singular value transform and I wanna get done I don't want to go over time. I want to have people be able to ask questions. So let me just point out, this is really the key feature. <clears throat> so what this means is that the Hilbert space for the overall system is broken up into the direct sum of, of, Hil of two dimensional Hilbert spaces, one for every singular value. So for every singular value, we have these eigenspaces and we have these Hilbert spaces here, uh, the, the, and the, the jth eigenspace is spanned by uh, vectors of this form, Rj plus or minus Lj. So these are two-dimensional spaces because they're eigenspaces of H, then you find that you see that H preserves these eigenspaces. <clears throat> okay, now <clears throat> within if you, in, in this Rj plus or minus Lj basis, what you see, if, we, if I take, if I, what we see is that the Hamiltonian acts as sigma j times a Pauli x, and z acts just as a Pauli z. So the actual, we can figure out what's happening in the time evolution of the system just by saying, oh, let's suppose, let's apply H for a little bit of time and then let's apply Z for a little bit of time. And then let's see what happens. And so let's just focus in this two dimensional subspace corresponding to the J singular value. Well, if we can apply H and we can apply Z, then we actually can also, we can first apply Z for a little bit of time, phi, and then we can apply, we look at H, then we can apply uh, Z for the inverse amount of time. And we find that we get a matrix that looks like this. It's acting again, it acts on this, this subspace, this two dimensional subspace of just a single you know, qubit. And we find that now this is sigma J times a Pauli matrix or some rotation. It's a rotation about the phi axis in the XY plane. So, when we're applying first, you know, Z, then H, then Z, then H, then Z, then H in this Hamiltonian form, we see what we're actually doing is we're performing arbitrary rotations within this subspace. And the rate of the rotation, which is given by, is given by the singular value. 
So we're going to be rotating by different amounts within different subspaces, depending on the singular value. And so when we actually apply this, let's see what happens on the overall state of the system. Now the overall system, we, we divide it up into these subspaces, just these two qubit, the, these qubit, one qubit subspaces. And the action of H and Z on, uh, is just the direct sum of its action on these two qubit subspace, on these single qubit subspaces. And when we write out this U, if we see, oh, we're just gonna apply this, 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 this. This is, we know, this is just the same formula that we had before, but now we're being kind of, sorry, that we had before, but now we're specifically applying uh, time dependent or Hamiltonian and uh, modulating it with this very simple Z Hamiltonian. So it's actually very, we're, we're being very sparse in terms of what we're doing. And then you just write this out again, these, now these Gs are just, Paulis, they're just giving Paulis. So each one is a cosine theta times the identity minus I sine theta times some Pauli. And you write out what it is. It's just, I just get a polynomial. And on the jth subspace, I get a polynomial in cosines and sines. And so in the jth subspace, I just get a, an SU2 rotation, just an SU2 rotation in the subspace, which is some polynomial in cosine thetas, cosine sigmas on the diagonal and some another polynomial on the off diagonal. And um, if there are K of these terms, then this is just a Kth order polynomial in these cosines and sines. I mean, if you, if you're, you know, you just, just write this out as E to the minus, as cosine, you know, cosine sigma J T one times the identity minus I sine sigma J one times the times sigma times the, the rotation. And here's what you get. So this is, this is the action of this U on, on each of these individual two-dimensional subspaces corresponding to the singular value. And then the only, really the only restriction here is that um, for unitarity, you have to have um, these P cosine squared theta, the sine squared theta, Q cosine squared is equal to one. The sum of these is equal to one. And that's, this makes it um, an, uh, a transformation in SU2. And historically, actually, this is this 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 you know this feature about sines and cosines and rotations in SU two. This was noted by Chebyshev, and these polynomials are just Chebyshev polynomials. Uh, so this is actually very. It, this may look like radical and state of the art, but it's not. It's actually something you know that that was uh, noted by Chebyshev, and we said, oh, you know, we have these ways of decomposing sines and cosines, and Chebyshev polynomials are are the polynomials you get. We say sine of theta one plus theta two is sine of theta one cos theta two plus sine theta two cos theta one. You know, those are the Chebyshev polynomials. And so those are exactly what appears when you, you actually expand out what's happening when I'm trying to control the system in a Hamiltonian fashion. Okay. So um, are there any questions about this? I, 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 this is a little mathematical, but actually, it's for people, you know, since I'm assuming pretty much everybody out there is familiar about SU2 rotations, actually what's happening, even though the, the overall Hilbert space may be humongous, uh, you can figure out what's happening just by looking at these two dimensional subspaces um, corresponding to the different singular values. And what happens there is given by these simple formulas in terms of Chebyshev polynomials. And this, of course, is the key. This is the key realization that came from Ike Chuang's work on cubitization, this work by Gillian et al. to get to the, the kind of the ultimate limit of how well you can do with singular value transforms, is you can say, oh, well, look, let's actually just take this function f, recall what the function f is, it's just some arbitrary function that we wish to enact. We want to apply f of a. Let's take this function f and we're going to decompose it in terms of Chebyshev polynomials. Because Chebyshev polynomials are famously form a basis for the set of all functions. You know, not make quite as familiar as the Fourier basis, but you know, pretty close. So the, the, the rule is what you do is you decompose. I'm sorry, this like when I photographed this, this got a little squished up here. I hope that you can read it. Uh, uh, we take this sine sigma j, q star sigma j, that's going to be f of sigma j. So we're going to pick 
are we have, we can by picking these times here and these phi's we can tune these polynomials to be any Chebyshev polynomial we want and so we're going to pick it so that we we have that this q star this Chebyshev polynomial in sines and cosines this is just f of sigma so that's and when we do that and we actually go and you rewrite what is happening here on, in these individual subspaces, you find that the overall transformation that you're performing by this Hamiltonian, you know, it's, it's by this Hamiltonian control applying the, or the, this Hamiltonian H plus or minus H applying plus or minus Z, you find what you get is the following unitary. And this unitary has on the off diagonals, it has F of A, it has just the thing we want to apply. And on the other off diagonal, it has F of A dagger. And then the stuff that's on the diagonals is just, is this is what you get on the diagonals and it's there to make it unitary. What's important is that you have F of A, the thing that you want to apply on the off diagonal. And so now you're actually able to apply this. When I apply this to a vector, the, the, the part of the vector that's in the right, um, that's in the, the uh, Hilbert space span by the right singular vectors gets multiplied by F of A. And that's exactly the quantum singular value transform. By the way, if, if I, I encourage you, if, if, if we had a lot of fun in talking about this, when I, I showed this formula to the folks in the collaboration on our paper, people say, hold it, is that unitary? I don't, is, is it unitary? I, I, I don't understand. So I encourage you, if you write down this formula, to figure out, to convince yourself that this is unitary. It's kind of a fun exercise. If, if you want, you can sneak a peek, at, peek at the paper and see what the argument is, but it's more fun to try to do it yourself. Okay, <clears throat> that's it. I mean, so the ability to apply this Hamiltonian A, uh, A that has A as a block, and then we don't care what the other blocks are. The other block has, other, the corresponding block has to have A dagger in it. We don't care what the other block is, together with the ability to apply this simple sigma z Hamiltonian that changes the phases between right singular vectors and left singular vectors, means that we can apply a unitary transformation in which f of a is a block. And that is the quantum singular value transform. I mean, again, if f of sigma is one over sigma, this is matrix inversion. Um, but there are plenty of other things that you might want to apply it to. And so you can apply this, and if you go through this, the scaling for this Hamiltonian algorithm I described is the same as the unitary quantum singular value transform. And it scales as one over the smallest singular value of A, which is the condition number of A. And it scales as log of one over epsilon. And the reason it scales as log of one over epsilon is that this Chebyshev approximation to a particular function, oh, I think I wrote it here, though it's hard to see because in photographing it, it got kind of smushed is that the accuracy scales, the, the number of the degree of these polynomials that we need to get accuracy epsilon goes as log of one over epsilon. So it's good, it's good. And um, the, the very long paper about quantum singular value transform basically points out that this is essentially the optimal scaling and you're not really gonna get better than this. Hey Seth, I, I got another question coming in. Yeah, go for it. So now, now someone is asking, how does this quantum scaling compare to the classical scaling for some of these tasks? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so the um, I left out great, great question. So, so here, and this is um, uh, uh, the the main difference. Oh, I should have actually, I should definitely put this in here. I didn't put it in there. The main point here is that this scales as if I look at the dimension of the space, then this scales as log of the dimension of the space, the quantum scaling. It just scales as the number of qubits or Q modes. Um, uh, so because you know, you're just applying this Hamiltonian to these qubits and Q modes, and then the, uh, you, you just have this number of terms that scales in that fashion. Whereas the classical ones, they have a similar kind of scaling in terms of sigma min and epsilon, so you get something like one over sigma min log of one over epsilon, but then it scales as the dimension of the space. So if you're trying to do this you know, for a generic matrix A, in fact, it's even worse than that actually, it could go as the dimension cubed. 
um, depending on what A is. If A is sparse, it's like the dimension log the dimension. So very good question. So the, the real advantage here compared with classical uh, 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 singular value uh, decomposition and transform is that it's you have an exponential speed up in terms of the dimension of the space to which you're applying um, your transformation, which is the normal case for for these quantum linear algebraic transformations. The point is you can you know you you when you encode your vectors as states of qubits, a vector of size n gets gets encoded as log n qubits. Great, interrupt anytime you want. Here are the applications I've just mentioned. Okay, I already mentioned linear systems algorithm. If you make f of a is equal to one plus b delta t, and then you, you just apply this transformation multiple times, what you find is that you're stepping through, you're creating the history state for um, a, the solution for a differential equation. So this is just, this just when f of a is equal to this, I just get the Euler forward version of solving these differential equations. And this is also a very efficient way to do a quantum differential equation solver. It's the most efficient way that I know of at any rate. Yeah, and you can do, you know, you, from linear systems, you can do quadratic optimization, data fitting, quantum principle component analysis. So, I mean, Ike is kind of right that this is sort of like the mother of all algorithms. <clears throat> I see and uh, mother of all quantum algorithms. It, 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 it's the most efficient way of doing a large number of quantum linear algebraic protocols. Okay. There's another question, Seth. Oh yeah, go for it. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. I'll just read it for you. So they are writing, if we go back to the Hamiltonian evolution, how is this scaling related to the time step delta t? Oh yeah, 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 I saw that. Let me, let, that's a very good question. So, so this is, you know, this is a very, uh, 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 you're raising, uh, uh, dear anonymous, you're raising an extremely important point. And let me just go back to, uh, to sorry about that. To the, the, this gate count, right? I actually think this is kind of, in some sense, an open question. I just did a very naive version of the gate count here in this slide. I just assumed that, you know, that we use the bandwidth of the controls so the controls can vary widely, you know, from time step to time step to time step. Um, so that means that the, 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 the slicing time of that is the Nyquist frequency. It's, you know, one over two times the bandwidth. But actually in this formula right here, if we're looking at the time, if we build up this by trotterization, we have to assume that, that H is only varying by a very small amount from trotter step to trotter step. So this delta T is a lot smaller and then a lot smaller than the, um, than the sampling time for the controls. And I actually, it's, I, I don't actually know the exact correct way of comparing, you know, the Hamiltonian depth of a circuit and the Hamiltonian, well, the Hamiltonian width of a circuit, I can compare that, but comparing the Hamiltonian depth of a circuit to the gate count in a quantum logic circuit. And I, I guess the, I guess I would, I would say, let's talk about that because I think that it's, it's not quite clear how to do that. Here, this Delta T again has got to be much smaller than one over the, uh, uh, smaller than, than the uh, one over the energy, largest energy scale for this B right here. Okay, let's see. Here's another question. Okay, question. Uh, is it anonymous? Is it, sorry, excuse me, question. Is it anonymous? Is it correct to assume that the Hamiltonian replaces the gates in a circuit model? If so, is there anything in, hidden in the initialization and, and readout? Um, yeah, I mean, good question. And, and I guess I talked about, mentioned that just a bit. I mean, it, what's happening is, you know, we have these global Hamiltonians, for instance, you know, in which all the qubits could be simultaneously connected all these other qubits. And so these global Hamiltonians are, you know, operating all the time. And so they're not a quantum logic gate. So we're trying to, it's difficult to compare this where we, we you know, we break up the circuit, you know, into uh, uh, first we apply a Hamiltonian to these two qubits, then we apply a Hamiltonian to these two qubits, then we apply a Hamiltonian to these two qubits. Um, 
And uh, so again, I'm not exactly sure how to, the, the correct way to compare those. Um, I can think of several and they're different from each other. So not what no, no was the best one. Okay, and is there anything hidden in the initialization and readout? Well, that of course is, is a very important question because as, as, uh, as, as you know, as everybody knows, and as Scott Aronson is fond of pointing out, this question of how you prepare the, the initial states and how you read them out, that's extremely important. So, you know, you can't actually read out the individual, if you do matrix inversion, like linear systems algorithm, you can't just read out the answers, you have to take, make a measurement, take some expectation values. Okay, so th those are very good questions. I, this is, you know, this is, uh, I would actually say that, I mean, uh, of course, I've been thinking about this kind of quantum control aspect of this for a long time, but thinking about when you start to say, let's rewrite, let's redo quantum computing in terms of this Hamiltonian control. Um, this is something in which uh, little has been done. And uh, uh, this is our, you know, this is, we have several other, uh, protocols and algorithms using this, but this is the kind of one of the zestier ones. But you know, there's there little is known, and so there are a lot of open questions. But certainly, the same problems that plague uh, data loading and readout for ordinary gate-based quantum computers will play. Will those versions of those problems will show up here? Okay, I promised to end on time, and so I'm going to do that. So here, here again is this picture. I'm just gonna end with the same picture that I started out with. So here we are in 2021. Uh, here's fault tolerance, 2035 plus or minus never. And, and here's kind of like, I don't, again, I don't know what's on this axis. Uh, maybe it's hype, quantum hype, <laughs> the hype cycle. <clears throat> but anyway, we have to, if we want to get to uh, all over to fault tolerance, we really need to find a, you know, sweet applications for the beautiful devices that people are making now. And uh, I've suggested that this Hamiltonian quantum computing is a way of bridging this gap. And I'd like to invite anybody who wants to talk about it to correspond and to chat, who has ideas of doing this, I'd, I'd like to invite you to get in touch. Um, <clears throat> we're kind of, we're, uh, uh, Michelle Riley, my co-founder of Turing and I, we're founding a, a quantum guild, we call it, to, you know, it, it's not a not very secret society uh, <laughs> to get together and discuss these things because I think, we think that now is the time to work out strategies for bridging this gap. I mean, there's gonna be a lot of very fun stuff to do, but it would be great to have this conversation. And I encourage you to get in touch with me. We'd have this privately, but let's have some more questions because we actually have a few more minutes. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Seth, for, for a super interesting, really great talk. Um, I see that questions are starting to kind of pop up. I, I think I'm gonna read out the question by Kieran Dalton that I think appeared first. The question asks, how does one carry out measurement at the end of the Hamiltonian computation? Which qubits do we measure? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, the, the answer for that is really the same as kind of the answer for um, things like quantum linear systems algorithm and for uh, uh, most of these, um, most of these uh, uh, quantum algorithms. So we can simulate, we can apply, you know, we can apply effective Hamiltonians uh, that are sparse or that are generated out of this algebra that you get by multiplying sparse Hamiltonians. And then actually this Hamiltonian picture, because it, it, it tells you right away what you can also measure, because it means that we can make measurements that correspond to Hermitian operators that are sparse or that are generated from the algebra of the sparse Hamiltonians that we're capable of applying. So there's a kind of, there's a, kind of a simple mathematical answer to that as well. And, um, uh, yeah, so the, the uh, and, and that means, you know, things like this also, this includes things like qubits and stuff like that. By the way, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to take advantage of the fact that um, I'm actually in our Turing headquarters here to show you what it looks like, the view from here. If you can see the Empire State Building down here in Brooklyn, it's there in the distance. <laughs> and we have, we have lots of nice art here. <laughs> 
I'm trying to distract people from the fact that I don't know the answers to all their questions. <laughs> well, I think this is great. I, I see at least three people in the in the attendee section that are very talented, just finished PhD students that might be looking for jobs. So yeah, we're we're hiring now. Actually, you know, we have uh, the 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 maybe not surprisingly, this message. Um, the message that we need to do something with these beautiful devices that quantum computing companies are building, do it now rather than 15 years from now. This message resonates quite strongly with the quantum computing companies. So yeah, anybody wants a job, just get in touch. <laughs> okay, great. I think we've promoted Alex Lasek to a panelist. So Alex, you could come on and ask your question. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, hi, Seth. So hi, Alex. you have this sort of control Hamiltonian and you switch it on and off uh, many times for various amounts of time to generate this uh, uh, this uh, unitary. So have you considered uh, if the change is not actually instantaneous and it takes some time to switch it on? And then during this time, it's going to be some intermediate transient Hamiltonian. Uh, would you have a good way to deal with that and what errors would uh, arise from? Yeah, that, that's an extremely good point. Yeah, that, and that, of course, in fact, if you look at the, um, th this is a problem in gate-based quantum computing as well, right? Because of course, gate-based yes. quantum computing operates in this fashion. So yeah, you have to be, that's a very good point. I mean, so if you just, if your control fields are simply turning on you know, a fixed Hamiltonian, but just changing its strength, then that falls under the formalism that I gave. But indeed, in, the, in talking with the folks in at places like, you know, INQ or Google, while they're, or, and also working with other superconducting folks, you know, while you're turning things on, then you have to be quite careful and to see if the Hamiltonian is actually what you think it's going to be. So in fact, th this, this is particularly true in superconducting systems, less so in ion traps, but in superconducting systems, as you probably know, that as you vary the flux in a loop, a Josephson junction loop that, that determines the coupling, for example, between two qubits, or let's say determines a single qubit Hamiltonian, then what happens is it, it, you, know, you go from being say all sigma X to all sigma Z with something, and then you continuously go in between. So you do have to be careful about that. I completely agree. And those are the kinds of errors that, that um, the people who are building quantum computers have to, are worry a lot about controlling and we have to worry about them too. So if the question is, am I worried? The answer is yes. And how do you deal with it? With a uh, uh, carefully. <laughs> As this specifically, because we actually worked on uh, similar control problems. Uh, I think it's quite general. So maybe it would be applicable to even uh, your formalism, but thanks for the answer. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely true. And, and in fact, in our, our protocols, we, we take this into account um, in our protocols for where we're um, looking, for instance, at superconducting qubits, because you got to, yeah. Then, then of course, but as you say, then it makes it trickier because you actually have to be, um, if, if you only are applying a single Hamiltonian and you're turning it on and off, then the only thing that's important is the uh, envelope underneath, the, the area of the envelope underneath the pulse. But if the Hamiltonian is changing as a function of the strength you're doing it, then as you know very well, that's not true any longer. <clears throat> okay, I think we have another question in the Q&A section. I, I'll read it out. Is there any hope that the Hamiltonian formalism is more robust to errors? So it's a bit along the, along the lines of Alex's question. Yeah, I mean, actually, I, I would say, I would say yes. I mean, first of all, the a lot of the errors in quantum computing and quantum computers come from, you know, parts of the Hamiltonian that you wish weren't there. <laughs> you know, uh, coupling between qubits that you fail to turn off. And then the other feature is that um, when you, the, I mean, I, I say, I, I'm kind of claiming that this is a, a, this is a more physical picture of how quantum computing takes place. 
So the coherence time is not, you don't worry so much about the coherence of individual qubits, but you worry about the coherence time of the whole system. So your error model is actually quite different in, in this case compared with the error model that people use for fault tolerance. And fault tolerance, people say, you know, the bread and butter one is there's some probability of the qubit being defaced or erased or something like that. Um, and at each quantum logic gate, at each period of time, there's some probability of this happening. But, you know, if you have all these, you have all these qubits or all these Q modes, they're interacting with each other. If you have control over that interaction, then the question you're really interested in Hamiltonian quantum computing is what is this overall length of time that you can actually have the system run before things fall apart? And of course, you know, we have theoretical pictures and you know, experimental pictures of how uh, environmental interactions with these systems, but we, what, what I don't know, and it would be great to get help finding this out is how, for example, let's take something like the Hamiltonian QSVT, quantum singular value transform, even in this, in this abstract form that I gave it and say, well, how well does it scale if we have like, you know, a particular model, a simple model of environmental direction, right? Does it, does it actually, is it robust against this? Uh, is it, for instance, it might be, is it more robust than the gate model? My guess is it's more robust than, than the gate model, but I don't know the answer. Okay, uh, I've invited Christopher Long uh, into the panel so that Christopher can ask his question live. Are you with us? Hi. Yeah, sorry, my Zoom crashed when I tried to join the panel, but I'm back. Um, my question was that you mentioned there were a few different ways of comparing the uh, time complexities of the Hamiltonian model and the circuit model. I just wondered if you could elaborate on like why, what, what different ways you thought of and why they're potentially different. Yeah, so, so um, I could pull up the slides again, but that would be kind of dull. So the, the way that I described, uh, that, that I actually presented, that, that I'll describe two ways. One was the way I described it, which is just like, you know, the gate count is the bandwidth times the time times the number of degrees of freedom. And what that tells you, that, that's something that actually, that, and this is the bandwidth of the control fields, right? So the, this says, the bandwidth of, it tells you one over the bandwidth of said, or two, one over two times the bandwidth of the time it takes to switch a control field from one value to an entirely different value. So that's certainly a reasonable, a reasonable uh, model, a, re a reasonable gate count. But in fact, since we're actually building things up in this kind of trotterized fashion with these little time slip, these little time steps, in this trotterized fashion, the delta t for these trotterized steps is much much smaller than the uh, than this uh, uh, Nyquist one over the Nyquist frequency. So uh, then the the sample size, one could also say have a reasonable estimate of a gate count, which will be a different gate count, which says let's look at the delta t. We pick delta t at the scale which is compatible with how the control fields are changing. To you know we have a particular error model for what's going on, and then we do we count uh, in terms of those delta t's. So we have then we have the number of degrees of freedom times the time, the overall time divided by the smaller delta t. And that of course gives you very that gives you very high gate counts. <laughs> so I right, thought it was I unfair. I thought it was, you know, if I could I, I even even the the more pessimistic up one that I gave with like 100 megahertz controls for ion traps in like 50 seconds, I got you know 10 to the 12th gates, right? So I thought it would be very unfair to say, okay, actually the delta T is something that's much, much smaller than one over hundred megahertz. And then I would get a number like 10 to the 16 or 10 to the 18, but that, that struck me as too ridiculous actually to say. So I, I didn't say, but these are different, you know, they're, they're different figures of merit. It's not clear what gate count means in this context. <clears throat> oh, and there's a third, I'll give a third one. I'll give a third one. So the third one is just for the heck of it. <clears throat> So, and this is, we'll give you a smaller number. You take the, uh, you can take the um, interaction strength, right? Between, and um, the, the, the weakest interaction strength. And then you multiply that times the overall time times the number of degrees of freedom. 
And that will give you a smaller number for something like ion traps because the ions are weakly coupled to each other. And, but it's not clear that that's the right, it's not clear just what that means. So <laughs> their gate count, <clears throat> it's not clear what they're, there are multiple versions of gate count for Hamiltonian quantum computing and each means something different. I'm not sure that one should even declare one of them to be the gate count. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks Christopher. Uh, we have another question from uh, Charles Smith who's asking, what are the implications of this algorithm for applying error correction? Yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> so, um, of course, the whole purpose of developing methods like this is to go uh, beyond the gate version of um, quantum computing and error correction is normally phrased in those terms. <clears throat> but error correction and mitigation in a Hamiltonian context is well known. There are models for Hamiltonian error correction that were developed for uh, adiabatic quantum computing and quantum annealing. And then there are error mitigation techniques, which every experimentalist use, things like you know, spin echo techniques to decouple things from, uh, decouple uh, degrees of freedom from each other. So the, the kinds of Hamiltonian uh, error correction, error suppression and error mitigation techniques are, are well known. And one can, you know, would, it's certainly a good place to develop more of them. Um, it would be extremely interesting uh, to, and I know that people have done some, made some attempts at this often, some of them have failed to recast, you know, the ordinary theory of quantum error correcting codes with ancilla and stuff like that in a Hamiltonian context. If that were possible to do, that would be extremely interesting. Um, uh, the papers that I've read have, some of the papers said you can't do this, but I don't, I don't know if I believe that. <clears throat> Okay, do we have any more questions? I think this is the last shot that we've gone, gone through quite a few. Um, let's see, doesn't seem to be anything showing up. Hugo, can you see any more questions? No, I think we've had uh, quite a lot of questions. This was a really interesting talk. Thank you very much for this. It's <laughs> a good way to kick off the term. And yeah, I mean, these, these are really exciting times for quantum computing, but scary, right? Exciting, but scary. So like, are we gonna make it to fault tolerance or not? And, you know, I, I, I'm of the opinion that if we don't hang together, we will surely hang separately. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, thanks a lot for, for joining us, Seth. And thanks a lot for everyone in the, in the call. Um, Looking forward to seeing you around at, at our weekly meetings. This, this Great, summer. starting up this starting up this coming week. Yeah, we'll be in touch about a time. <laughs> Great. Okay.